together and worship today, and we just pray that you would speak to our hearts as we come and uh, open our ears to your word so that we can hear it and understand it and apply it to our, our lives. And it's in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, how many times has this happened to you? You're going along during the week and you're writing your sermon, and all of a sudden on Friday, you... you it, during the week, it's this, this little nagging voice. It starts out as a, just a little whisper saying, you're not preaching the right sermon. And then as the week progresses, it gets louder and louder and louder until finally on Friday, you say, okay, okay, I'll write another sermon. Uh, anybody have that? that uh, well, that happened to me. And uh, it, it, what, what it is is that I, I preached a sermon on hate last week. Uh, how the Bible says that we are not to hate people. Uh, when somebody offends us, we need to uh, work to forgive them, do whatever it takes. You know, um, uh, We forgive two ways. One is through uh, me going to, to the person and confronting them and they apologize, or they feel bad. That happens a lot, right? Where they come to me and they say, you know, I realize what I did was wrong and I'm sorry. Um, that's one way of dealing with offenses. And then the other way is through the prayer of release. And I've had to do that a few times in the last couple of days where I've been pretty angry about something and or things, uh, things that have happened that have really offended me, and I've had to pray that prayer of release uh, to free myself of the burden of that. And that prayer of release is, God, you know what... Uh, use myself... You know what Tracy did this morning when he was mean to me at worship practice? You know how much it hurt me. But you tell me in your word I shouldn't avenge myself, so I give you the anger, the offense, and the pain of what Pastor Tracy did. Please don't let this bother me anymore. You do what needs to done with, be done with this person. Thank you for taking me in your defense and the pain of what Tracy did. Amen. So you pray that. That's a prayer of release. And uh, You know who wrote that? Who wrote that? You. No, <laughs> not me. Dr. Gary Chapman, you know the five love languages author? author? If you're over 40, you know what that's, that's talking about? Um, he wrote that, and, and he uses that in his ministry, and we use that here in New Life, and, and it really helps to relieve the, the anger and the emotional pain that you get when you're offended by people. Um, so that's one way to keep us from being hateful, because if you don't, if you don't do one of those two things, you become hateful. You develop a hatred for this person, and we talked about that last week. But I realized, you know what, I didn't cover the subject thoroughly. And here's, here's why, uh, if you look at Leviticus 19, 17, and 18, this just kept nagging me and nagging me after, a ser after my sermon, and I hate it when that happens. Leviticus 19, 17, and 18 says, You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall surely rebuke your neighbor and not bear sin because of him. You will not you shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now we know that Jesus is, in the New Testament says that our neighbor is somebody is anybody, right? But in the Old Testament they didn't really have that philosophy. And in fact, if you look at that passage, who does it sound like it's referring to? other Jews, specifically just Jews. Uh, the word brother is used of those who have a common parent or ancestor, right? And the Jews had a common ancestor. Uh, who was that? Father uh, Abraham, Abraham and sons. Okay. Um, and the children of your people, the word people can refer to anyone, but it specifically here refers to the sons of Israel. And so God's command to love and not hate does not specifically include everyone in this passage, and it was nagging me. What did, what, what did I miss there in that? 
So then I, I started thinking about it, and we looked at Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. It says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That was a teaching in Jesus' day. And, and uh, so I thought, you know, I really need to focus on what does it mean uh, in hatred of an enemy? We've talked about hating people who offend us. But what about people who are enemies? Have you ever had an enemy? Somebody who just hated you and wanted to, you know, their, their life was dedicated to making your life miserable? You know, in high school, I was, I, was, I was not the most popular person in high school. Hard to believe. Hard to believe. Okay, I, I have very few friends. Right, I was talking to Susie. We were, you know, we've talked through the years about me being having Ashburgers of some degree, and we talked about the fact that in grade school I never had any. I don't remember having any friends in grade school. Um, anybody else have that problem? I don't remember school friends. You know, I had neighborhood friends that I would play, but not school friends. Uh, but in high school, there were these two guys. And every time they saw me in the hallway, they called me names, harassed me. Every time they saw me in high school, I never had them in a class. I never talked to them. I don't, I don't even know that I knew their names. I never knew their names, and yet they felt it was their responsibility every day they saw me in the hall to call me names. And actually, when I, I went through the, the offense list that we do, you know, long-term offense list, I had to put the guys who called me names because I had no idea who they were when I did the releasing for them for that those offenses. So um, I've had people who, had, fortunately, I don't believe I have anybody who's an enemy to me now. If they are, they're doing a good job of hiding themselves. But uh, what is Jesus talking about when he says, "You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy"? I always thought that this was a a tradition of the the rabbis. You know, the rabbis would have traditions that they would they would interpret the law and then they would explain it and then everybody that became the interpretation of how this was supposed to be done. The rabbis never had that as an interpretation. And it I've I looked and nowhere in the Bible does it have that as a statement. So where does this statement come from? Well um, there's a group of people who lived outside of the Jewish community in the time of Jesus, and they were called the Essenes. They were they were they lived a monastic life. They were they just lived in this place called Qumran. Have you ever heard of Qumran? Qumran is a, a site in the 1920s where a little boy was playing a Jewish boy, uh, not a Jewish boy, an Arab boy was looking for his sheep, and and so they would throw rocks in the caves to see if the sheep were in there, and uh, depending on what happened when they threw the rock in there, either there was a, a roar or a bah, then they would know what was in there and whether to go in or not. Well, he threw this rock into the cave and it, it went boom, exploded. And so he went inside to look and it turns out that there were buried in this cave jars, big jars that were full of manuscripts. And what had happened is that G these people who, the Essenes, there was, you know, there's the Pharisees who were uh, a group of people in the time of Jesus. The Sadducees, the Pharisees believed all of, in all of the scriptures. They, they believed in heaven and hell, and they believed in the eternal soul. The Sadducees didn't believe in the soul, and they were sad, you see. And then you, you had the Essenes. Okay, I'm sorry, but that was that's a joke that goes back 150 years, so don't blame me. Uh, and then you had the Essenes, and the Essenes were this private sector group of people, and they lived in this community called in Qumran. Uh, and then in the 50, or the, the I believe it was in the 20s, it could have been the, later than that. They this this boy found these manuscripts, and there were thousands and thousands of them there. And so uh, through the years, they translated the the different manuscripts, and in this community's manuscript is what's called the the Manual of Discipline, and it dates from around 100 BC. And the community rule begins by saying that members of the community should be taught to seek God and obey Moses and the prophets, so that they may love all the sons of light, each according to his lot in God's design, and hate all the sons of darkness, each according to his guilt and God's vengeance. And the, they noted that 
just like I noticed as I was mulling over last week's sermon, I don't do that often. Usually I forget my, my sermon after I preach it, never to think of it again, just like the rest of us. <laughs> they noted as well that it uses the term your brother and your people and your neighbor. And so for them, uh, they decided that that was not just Jews, but only the people in their community. And so they were not, the, the leaders were not uh, permitted to correct or rebuke outsiders, including fellow Jews, because they saw them as apostate. Harboring hatred in one's heart toward outsiders was permitted in the Qumran community. In fact, it says, everlasting hatred in a spirit of secrecy for the men of perdition. And they based this narrow interpretation out of, of Leviticus 19, 17, 18 on Nahum 1 and 2, which says the Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. And so it's our responsibility to imitate God, right? And so in order to imitate God, we need to hate our enemies. That was their, their interpretation. That uh, whole thing was written by Dr. Douglas Ward, who is the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Judeo-Christian History, Theology, and Culture. If you're interested, I will help you with that. And what it shows is that people can twist what the Bible says about loving and hating to justify their behavior. You know, we, we redefine what it means to love and hate to be what we want to do often, right? I mean, isn't that how... I mean, uh, I, I can say that this is a loving thing for me to do, uh, and it isn't loving. The Bible clearly defines what loving is and what loving is not, what hating is and what hating is not. But it's our tendency in, in, in uh, Christianity today to redefine our Christianity by our preferences. Am I guilty of that? I am, in many ways. I have to work at not being that kind of person, and we have to work at not being that kind of people as a church. So, um, does the Bible support the idea that we should hate our enemies? I've got some illustrations that show that it doesn't. Uh, in the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 23, verses 4 and 5, in the law, again, of Moses, it says, if you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, so you're, you know, going down the road and you're walking and you see your enemy's ox or his donkey. How many times does it happen to anybody? <laughs> Kill it. Take it home and eat it. No. You shall surely bring it back to him again. To who? To your enemy. If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying under its burden and you would refrain from helping it, you shall surely help him with it. So what are we supposed to do to our enemies according to Exodus 23, 45? Help them if they need the help. Right? This is somebody who hates you. Somebody who, who thinks that you're the worst person in the world and you don't even deserve to breathe the air that they breathe. Proverbs 24, 17, and 18. I, I quoted this one to Susie just the other day. Do not rejoice when your enemy falls, and do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles, lest the Lord see it and despise him, and, dis and it displease him, and he turn away his wrath from him. That's kind of a catch-22 thing, right? You don't want to rejoice in your enemy's calamity because the Lord might take it away. And you want your enemy to suffer calamity. Okay. Get it? There are some really good stories that sh illustrate the uh, um, the way people in the Old Testament, godly people, treated their enemies. Uh, when I when my kids were little, I used to read them the bizarre stories in the Bible. Do you ever do that? Read. There are some really bizarre stories in the Bible. And um, one of the stories is about Saul and David, and David is hiding in a cave uh, with his men because Saul and his army are looking for him, and Saul has to go to the bathroom. So he goes into the cave to go to the bathroom. And David and his men are in there. And David uh, cuts off the sash, part of his sash. He's going to the bathroom. Right? And 
And he feels really guilty about that because his men wanted to kill King Saul right there. He, he was an enemy to David. He was chasing David. He thought David deserved to die. And so they, they had made his life goal to kill David. And so uh, David was convicted when he cut that sash. And he, he went out and he said, hey, I shouldn't have done this. I'm sorry. But I'm letting you go. And so Saul uh, thanked him. He said, this is, you know, who, would, who would have the opportunity to kill their enemy like this and let them go? But there's another story, and this is uh, the story of Elisha. That's one of my favorite stories in the Bible. Um, of course, I have a lot of favorite stories in the Bible. But this is uh, in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 8. It starts out saying that the king of, of Syria was making war against Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel, the king of Syria, Syria is above Israel. Uh, and he consulted with his servants, saying, my camp will be in such and such a place. And the man of God said to the, the king of Israel, Elisha, said the king of Israel, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are coming down there. So the king of Israel sent someone to the place uh, of which the man of God had told him, and he warned him and was watchful, not just once or twice. So uh, this happened multiple times where the king of Syria came down, wanted to catch the king of Israel, and God used Elisha to keep him from being able to do that. So then in verse 11, it says, The heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing, and he called his servants and said to them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? Because how does the enemy find out information? A spy, a traitor, right? So the uh, king of Syria thought there was a traitor in their midst. And so somebody says, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet who is in Israel tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. That's scary. Right? So the king, he's a powerful king and he's got an army on his side and he decides, I'm going to go get Elisha. So, um, yes, where is he? And they say he's in Dothan. Uh, so it says in verse 14, Therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots everywhere. I love this. This is my favorite part of the story. And a servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? And so Elisha answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Don't you wish you could see that right now? All the, yeah. the angels and the, the chariots of fire that are surrounding New Life Bible Church right now? So when the Syrians came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Strike the people, I pray, with blindness. And God struck him with blindness, just as Elisha asked. So in verse 19, Now Elisha said to them, This is not the way, nor is this the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. But he led them to Samaria. Now Samaria was the capital city of the kingdom of Israel. Okay. So it was when they had come to Samaria that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of those these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes and they saw and they were inside Samaria. Samaria was a walled city. It was a you know capital city. It was huge. It's where the army was. Thousands of people. And then you've got this, this army and they're in the midst of this city and all of a sudden they see this. Can you imagine the sinking? Have you ever had that sinking feeling? I can't imagine how much of a sinking feeling these, these men must have had facing their certain death. So now when the king of Israel saw them, he said, My father, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? Can you just see it? Can I kill them? Can I kill them? Can I? Huh? Huh? And Elisha, Elisha answers and says, You shall not kill them. Would you kill those you have taken captive with your sword and your bow? set food and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. Then he prepared a great feast for them, and after that they ate and drank. He sent them away, and they went to their master. So the bands of Syria 
the Syrian raiders came no more into the land of Israel. How did Elisha treat the enemies of Israel? With respect, right? Mercy when they needed it. So the Old Testament does not support the idea of hating your enemy. And, and then in the New Testament, we have Jesus' instructions on uh, that in Matthew 5.44, which is the next verse after he says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. He says, But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who, who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do that? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do that? Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. So Jesus forbids us from hating our enemies people who hate us, people who despise us, from harming them. Uh, obviously, you know, this is back in the days when there was a lot of uh, inter-tribal battles and wars that went on. And in, when you were in a battle and you were fighting somebody, then you had that as a, 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 a soldier in the army, you had that responsibility to defend your country, right? But if your enemy was defenseless, you didn't take any action against him. You let him go. Bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Easiest words in the Bible to say, hardest words in the Bible Amen. to live. Right? But this is what God wants us to do. This is the kind of people he wants us to be. He wants us to be the people who... Love our enemies. When we see their donkey overweighted with a burden, and they're on the side of the road, they're kicking their donkey, trying to get him to get up, we stop, we pull over, we get out of our car, we help them with lift their donkey. <laughs> Maybe not a donkey. Maybe it's a flat tire. Maybe we're driving down the road, and they have a flat tire, and we see our enemy with a flat tire. What, do we, what should we do? We should pull over and help them with the flat tire. We should bless those who curse us. People who say bad things about us. We shouldn't say bad things back about them. We should do good to those who hate us. You know, when you have the opportunity. Um, this is tough because real life, okay, there are people I don't like. It's none of you. <laughs> but there are people I don't like, and I don't want to spend time with them because they're mean or unfriendly or rude or whatever. Uh, and there are people who don't like me and don't want to spend time with me. Really. It's true. So... Where's the balance? You know, we're looking for the balance between uh, our obligation to be loving to people who don't like us or maybe hate us. In reality, knowing that they don't necessarily want us. I mean, does that person who doesn't like me want to be want me to be with them every day and buddy buddy and treat them like they're my best friend and, and you know we're pals to the end kind of thing or BFF? Is that a thing? Or BFFs? No. They don't want to be around me. But if I find them in a p position or place where they need me, I need to be there. I need to be there. And I need to treat them with respect, regardless. And pray for them. We don't love our enemies because it's easy. We don't, we're not called to love our enemies because it's easy. We're called to love our enemies because it's godly. And that's, that's what God wants from us. He wants us to love our enemies. He wants us to love the people who offend us, and he wants to love the people who hate us. Because that's the kind of God that we have, and we need to imitate him. So, there, I hope that's my last sermon on hatred. <laughs>
Because, you know, I, have you had your toes stepped on in the last last week? Did anybody get their toes stepped on on the hatred thing last week? Anybody feel like I was, you know, coming down on it? Was there anybody here last week that was here today? <laughs> it's a hard topic, but it's one that we need to really be aware of as Christians, especially in our, our society today, which is, hatred is everywhere. Everywhere you look, there's hatred. We need to be different, right? We need to be Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are a God of love, and we thank you that you did not hate us because of our sin. You loved us in spite of our sin. And so, Lord, we pray that you would help us as your children to be people who are loving to those who hate us, people who are loving to those who commit offenses against us, Lord, so that we can be a reflection of your glory and your character in the world because it is by our love that the world knows that we're Christians. And it's that love that we can share to those who hate us and those who offend us, that is the most telling about who we are in Christ. So Lord, I pray that you would help us to be people who love.